Hey, this is Alpha for Shocks Video Guide, and today we're going to be taking a look at an unorthodox Protoss versus Terran opening. Um, and this is going to be a Warp Prism Colossus play. And we're actually going to see that um, when executed properly, this build is not really an all-in. Um, assuming that you have, you know, some good micro and uh, you're able to do a couple of things to minimize um, Terran scouting and preparation, you can really um, get into a pretty good position to deal with uh, any potential counterattacks or um, pressures that, you know, might ordinarily thwart this kind of play. So we see that we've spawned on Akalon Wastes, and in the bottom right-hand corner, we have um, the blue Terran, Xenocider, and his opponent in the top left, the red Protoss, Anda, who will be following for this match. So, Akalon Wastes is notable um, mostly in the sense that it's a one versus one map, uh, which is pretty significant actually because it, it means that scouting um, can occur later. It means that uh, there's no question about you know where your opponent is spawning. Um, you don't have to worry about any kind of unorthodox proxy locations beyond one or two. And you can really sort of um, assume that no matter what build you do, you're going to get a pretty decent read on what your opponent is doing, at least in a basic sense. Okay, so we see that our Protoss player has taken both of his gases, um, one after another, at around 15 to 16 supply. And this is not uncommon in the Protoss versus Terran matchup because um, it's really quite nice to get a Mothership Core. Um, I want to point out that the Protoss player is only putting two workers on each geyser, granting um, a gas income superior to three probes on one geyser, but not quite as much as three probes on two geysers. And the reason for this is to ensure that as many minerals are being mined as possible while still providing enough gas to get essential units and be in a good position to tech. Like, this is a tech opening. Um, we see that the Protoss player is getting a Zealot to be safe. Um, you know, this can help a lot against um, any sort of engineering bay block. And we see that uh, Xenocider has actually opted for a Reaper opening and into an expansion. He's only going to be producing the one Reaper and then just going into a reactor, and he's pulled off of gas. So this is not some sort of cheesy um, one base all in. Um, it's, it's just, you know, using this Reaper to um, scout. And the SCV did get in there and scout. Um, and this Reaper is also going to get in there and, and check the expansion timing. This expansion is a little bit later than most Protoss 1 gate expands. Um, and this Mothership Core is going to do a good job of zoning this Reaper. And the Zealot is being sent right across the map because when a Terran player opens uh, Reaper into Reactor Expand, they tend to have a delayed Marine count. And sometimes uh, their bunker is delayed as it is not even started yet. So... The Zealot can force the Reaper to pull back, um, as we can see here, and it can really force the Terran to play a little bit more conservatively. But back in Anda's base, we see that he's continuing to chrono boost probes and that he's put down his Nexus. So, very standard in the sense that most Protoss openings involve getting this kind of fast Nexus off of a single gateway. And we see that he's now going for a robotics facility, which is, again, very, very standard. And he's also saturating his gas geysers now. So um, that's, you know, this is around the time where you're going to be wanting to add that additional probe to each geyser. And I want to point out the great usage of the Mothership Core here to scout what the Terran is going for. It sees that gas is being mined, sees this additional barracks going down, sees that there are missile turrets being put down because, you know, Xenosider did scout this double gas, so... It's and a late expansion, so he's perhaps a little bit wary of any sort of um, DT-based play, or even perhaps oracles. Um, so this stalker playing safe by staying at home, um, there's no need to send it out because the Mothership Corps already got a full scout. Um, and the Protoss player is adding an additional couple of gateways. So right now, this looks like a pretty textbook Protoss infrastructure for Protoss versus Terran. You will have that three-gate robo infrastructure um, which is going to allow you to defend against any sort of Terran pokes and which also allows you to get decent tech. You see that uh, almost immediately uh, after he gets enough gas 
and uh, puts down a robotic space. So this is a Colossus opening. Um, it looks is exactly the same as a Colossus opening, and we also see that um, the extractor is being taken um, in the natural. So pretty fast um, assimilator actually at the natural, but uh, we see actually that the mothership core is so useful for defending these kind of marine pokes without taking any damage. And, you know, that's not a bad trade for the Terran player either because, you know, they are wasting the mothership core's energy essentially. But it's a good way to not have to invest in units and not risk losing any of these high energy, uh, or sorry, high gas costing units like the Sentry. So we see that the Protoss player is training out a Warp Prism and then is going to go for a Colossus right after that, followed by a Twilight Council. So... This is really interesting because it is simultaneously a harassment build that looks like a very standard Colossus opening, but also gets that Twilight Council to um, transition into Templar Tech. And I want to point out that the uh, Warp Prism speed upgrade is, is crucial to this build succeeding because um, you really need that speed upgrade to actually get... Uh, you know, any success with your Colossus drop. So we see that the Colossus is being picked up by the Warp Prism, and we see that a DT Shrine is actually going down, along with preparations to take a third base. This probe moving down here to take a third. So this build really relies on containing the Terran player um, with this drop followed up by the DT. Warp Prisms are really useful, uh, you know, transitionally to go into DT, obviously, for obvious reasons. And uh, it's timed in such a way that it, it's it's sort of like when the Terran wants to move out that you're going to be dropping in their base, as we can see. And we see that behind this, Anda is getting a lot more gateways and charge. So he's going to actually be able to um, pretty effectively deal with um, any sort of, you know... Um, aggression in the mid game and this colossus is actually doing quite a bit of damage um and again this photon overcharge is really proving its worth i mean there are there's you know four units for anda here now a couple more since he's warping in but very few units and you know no aoe aside from this colossus that's you know still in this warp prism which is now flying back after having essentially cleared out this natural and delayed mining and so on and so forth but you know now another Colossus is out, and no Thermal Lance, but that's fine because it's not really necessary. Charge about to finish, um, another Observer coming out, and now it's really a, a matter of defending this drop um, without taking too much damage, um, and then moving to take a third base. Um, see, the th if we take a look at what's really happened here, um, the Terran player has been delayed with respect to their third base, has had a few workers killed, has had mining time reduced, okay, and hasn't really been able to do any real damage to the Protoss player. The Protoss player, on the other hand, um, has charge up, is getting a Templar Archives, has a couple of Colossus, um, no Thermal Lance, but it's not really necessary for defensive Colossus-based play um, to get Thermal Lance because really it's, it's not... Um, a particularly useful um, upgrade to get um, with respect to defense. It, it doesn't really help that much. Um, and the Mothership Core is just instrumental in defending against these drops. I mean, this is a quite a bit of supply for Xenocider, and it's basically being, you know, kind of useless right now. Um, it's, it's not really able to push up until this Photon Overcharge wears off. It can't really snipe tech because there's that Photon Overcharge. And in the meantime, it's not here to defend against this. And that means that this third base isn't getting saturated. It means that mining time is being delayed. It means these units are getting harassed. Um, well, you know, it's, it's really not a good situation for Xenocider in general. He is going to get um, a good snipe of this Twilight Council, which is researching Blink. But it doesn't really matter because, you know, Blink is a good upgrade, but charge is already done. So um, it's not so bad for the Protoss player either. Uh, finally, uh, Double Forge has gone down, and that's really the only... Um, thing that this Protoss player had to worry about. Um, aside from a uh, slightly reduced drop defense, as we can see, uh, the lack of upgrades is really the only weakness uh, that you give up by opening with this very fast um, tech-based kind of build centering on the Colossi. Uh, as we can see, you know, Templar tech and Colossus tech are out on the field now, but 
there is an advantage for the Terran player with respect to upgrades. 2-2 has started, and 1-1 isn't even finished for the Protoss player. And that's, you know, a big deal in a way. But Xenosider's army has been consistently kept low. Um, his third base was delayed, and his SCV counts were reduced, which means that his production is most likely delayed. So he doesn't really have a huge number of units to go for some sort of 2-2 timing, which would ordinarily be considered really uh, quite scary for a Protoss player. And the third base went up for the Protoss player without any real trouble. So from here, the Protoss player is in actually quite a good position in terms of macro games. Um, and it really came from that uh, really unorthodox opening that he went for, which contained the Terran with the DT follow-up, opening up a lot of possibilities for the mid game and not actually costing that much in Heart of the Swarm. Um, and essentially, this build allowed the Ter I mean, the Protoss player to take a pretty convincing um, army lead. Uh, this composition is definitely a threat to this composition, especially once storms come into play. And we see that Anda is adding more gateways behind this as he continues to proceed into this macro um, style of Protoss versus Terran. So I hope you enjoyed this replay. Feel free to check out our existing library of strategies, tips, and more, and we'll see you next time.